I'm Dean Walker, and welcome to the Poetry of Predicament podcast, a podcast for people brave enough to face humanity's challenges and problems, and most importantly, our numerous predicaments. The Poetry of Predicament is a podcast meant to inspire us to bring forth grace, beauty, and connection with the web of life in the face of a predicament-laden world. In this episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast, Dean is interviewed by Michael Dowd as part of his post-doom conversations of 2020 and beyond. Michael's post-doom conversations are explorations with global thought leaders into the most important chapter in human history. Well, Dean, it's great to see you again, brother. We talked uh, in the summer, and I'm also delighted that uh, we can re-record this uh, conversation because not only do I relate to you as an older brother on this path that is having meaningful, heartful conversations around difficult, challenging subjects, including collapse and the potential or possible extinction of our species, which is rather difficult to have, but you've even added a name to that, you know, having difficult conversations, you know, uh, this sort of thing. What, what was the title of your, that series? Uh, the Impossible Conversation. Yeah, The Impossible and, Conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So at any rate, so I, I welcome you and uh, I, uh, I'm thrilled that we can have this conversation here in November of 2019. Yeah, good to be here with you, Michael. And it was great to see you in person too when we came through uh, Medford. That was that was quite a treat. Yeah. So, Dino, before I uh, ask the kind of questions that I've been asking my guests in this series, I'd like to just invite you to not be bashful, but help us get you. Like like people who haven't listened to your stuff, read your stuff, they don't know who Dean Splain Walker is. Um, help us understand what you're known for and what you're passionate about and what you're particularly concerned about these days. Yeah. Well, thanks. I, uh, I come from, um, a long, you know, number of decades, I guess about four decades of working in transformational training of some kind or another, working with corporate groups, training adults to work with at risk youth, um, working with uh, intimacy with couples, uh, a number of different kinds of training over many years. And there have certainly been some other occupations thrown in, but mainly that's what I've been doing. And then I add that to um, an even longer history of personal practices that have connected me with a, a remarkable set of of powerful lineages and in wisdom traditions of various kinds, ranging from that transformational training work that I, I just mentioned, you know, with the old in the old days with the S training and Life Spring and uh, you know a number of different groups that I ended up uh, participating in and working for, uh, but also a number of uh, energetic and shamanic traditions, uh, and not to mention just direct contact with earth uh, traditions that um, really kept me alive through a very troubled teen, teenage years and uh, really um, brought me from being downright crippled by that uh, very, very difficult upbringing uh, into fairly functional, if I do say so myself, uh, adulthood and, and to be able to work with people in the precious and intimate uh, and transformative ways that I've been able to do for all these years, I am just deeply grateful. And oddly enough, uh, since about seven years ago, when I really got my woke moment of realizing that not only is climate change happening, but abrupt uh, anthropogenic climate change is happening now and accelerating intensively, uh, but a number of other metrics are going on uh, that are actually far more urgent and far more detrimental to us on a short-term basis than, than climate change. Um, I didn't realize that I would find that to be a, a threshold, a time of 
realizing that that the, it really is too late. You know, I'm jumping ahead to what what you think I'm. You know, what what you're at, you asking me what my orientation is toward this doom conversation and so on. Um, in in preparing for and researching my book, uh, the impossible conversation that came out in 2017, I um, I realized I wasn't going to save a damn thing, and it was uh, far 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 too late. We'd missed every main major off ramps to hang on, hang on hang on a second that you, you uh, just when you just, was, just when you said we uh say the last two sentences you froze okay well you know when i when i released my book the impossible conversation in 2017 i realized that uh with the research that i did to vet this abrupt climate change information which was mind blowing um, I did vet it, <clears throat> and I could I could easily see that we're we're not going to save a damn thing. You know, I, I as much and please we'll get to the point where I can uh, you know <laughs> loop back and say that I'm not, I'm a huge fan of people stepping up and being activists and so on. But I could just see for myself there that what there was to do was to bring as much beauty and grace and love to this life experience as I can before I die and to do that with you know bringing my gifts so that's really been my orientation and ironically out of the other pieces that I was mentioning the pieces I had assembled over my lifetime it's the energetics it's the transformational work it's the shamanic work and the deep connection with earth that have come far more to the fore as being, these are the gifts that I can bring. These are the things that, that we're really starved for as a humanity now. And that's, you know, much to my surprise because we live in a life hack world and, you know, the six easy steps to something or other. And it, I am seeing that those are really hollow in the face of the depth of what we're facing, but yeah. you know that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. And I would like you to sort of go further down the path of, you know, how does the language of post doom work or not work for you? What language you use for our times, uh, our contracting and deteriorating times and what seems to be unfolding. Yeah. Um, so let's just start there. Okay. Well, I, I'm not a big fan of the word doom just because it's it, like so many things, are in, easily encumbered and, and um, co-opted for other use and, and dram hyper-dramatic use. And I, I'm not a big fan of the, we got enough drama going on to, but that's, that's just me in a, in a preference thing. Sure. Um, so you've already heard that I'm, I'm very much uh, in the camp of we've gone too far and uh, there are I'm, I've been looking really hard for about seven years solid now, not to mention going back to 1975 when I got my first instruction from the shamanic instructors that, that there was nothing to salvage in what I call the business as usual human operating system. There's nothing to salvage, they would say to me. And I was just a kid and I was like, what are you kidding? I mean, there's all this stuff and wait a minute, you know, so I, I took them seriously, but I took their advice and put it in my back pocket. And with my front pocket, I led into living my fully business as usual life for a long time, um, having to grapple with that. But to jump back into the language of doom that you're asking about, um, well, no, I don't. I don't use the word doom. I talk about post doom, and okay. for me, for me, doom is the midpoint yeah. between denial and regeneration, because yeah. life life is about regeneration. Life's going to regenerate with or without us. So for me, doom is the midpoint, the the emotional midpoint. I, I see doom as, as the inward aspect of collapse. That collapse is sort of the external stuff. Doom is that feeling of oh shit. When you realize we're not on a perpetual progress train, yeah. this train is going somewhere else, and it's not to uh, jetpacks and uh, lunar colonies. Right. So, but and I identify post doom. I define post doom as that which opens. Like what opens up when we remember who we are. Yeah. 
that we are life becoming aware of itself, that we are an expression of life or part of life, not, not its masters. So remembering who we are and accepting what's inevitable and then investing in what's pro future and soul nourishing. So I, yeah. I, I'm very clear about post doom, but what I'm meaning is post ugh or post, Oh shit, or post, we are so fucked or post whatever. Right. Right. Well, I, I appreciate you laying that out that way. And that, that does fit better for me. And, um, I have no hope whatsoever. I, uh, for some sort of imaginable next stage for humans to realize some cool way of being together after the dust settles or something. I, I just for that. You, um, you, fro you froze after you said dust settled. You, you froze after you said dust settled. Started again there. Okay. Um, there are two words that come to mind. Uh, that that could tell you a little bit about how I look into a future from here. One is hope and one is grief. Um, I find that hope is uh, really a, a twisted fragment uh, left over from our, our ecstatic fuel, fossil fuel driven party that's really caused all this destruction that we're talking about. And really, almost every version that I hear of hope has something to do with keeping that party going. Yeah. Even if we have to take it out back and downsize it, it's still going to be a party. Right. And I, I don't, and I don't find any use that's remotely like that of the word hope to be empowering at all. I find it to be a, um, a not sober word. Yes. Uh, in the midst of an AA meeting that is desperately needed. So um, the other one is grief. And similarly, I, I, don't, I don't find much that is um, honorable or respectable in our holding of grief. And um, basically that's because I, I think that the, the ticket that we had to buy come to to be a part of to enjoy the benefits of this business as usual culture was that we had to give up our connection to deeper self others earth and soul and really you know we probably none of us ever used those words and we never certainly never signed a contract to it but i have not yet a, met a person who hasn't sold out virtually all of those pieces and um, that's the nature of the work that I do is re is reconnection at that level. So well, yeah, well, let me let me ask a question along those lines. How how do you explain that? Like, if that's the case, which I you know intuitively think you may be right, how, how do you explain that? How do I explain it to what? People? What, 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 what led to people selling out on those? Well, when. When I look at it, uh, we had all the right foundation pieces in place, you know, colonialism, slavery, uh, the annihilation of indigenous cultures. We had those pieces pretty well moving along, but they all got, the, they got this jet fuel overlay from the fossil fuel infusion at the, you know, mostly in the 20th century. And we also had uh, this extraordinary uh, psychological or sociological uh, jet fuel added to the to this uh, equation, and that was the work that uh, eventually became known as propaganda and and all that from Bernays and a few of his cronies in the early 20th century, and uh, it basically was built on uh, those are very very powerful methodologies that are hard to overstate you know we don't have the time for it now but i think we can all agree that the sales side of stuff making us consumers before anything else and hyper consumers at that um, we can see that influence and we we can pretty much all of us admit yeah that's how we that's who we are that's what our whole world is we're immersed in it similarly there's a disempowerment and an, and an, uh, 
an influence, a mass influence on our consciousness in the way that has shown up in our governing systems. And so we are basically a completely disempowered uh, citizenry around the world. Anyone who's wanted to p play a part in this game and, and benefit from it uh, had to give up those sensitivities that would otherwise have said, whoa, something's not right here. This is not right relationship with the earth for us to be clearing these forests for this profit uh, we're destroying. And, and that has similar analogs in with, with my disconnection with deeper self, with others, and with soul. So I just wanted to pause there. That's what I was saying to answer your question. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's great. I, I Just last night, I watched a second video by this guy, Sid Smith, B. Sidney Smith, a mathematician. I had never encountered him before. And he's got two videos that I now have put like way up at the top of the list of presentations that I would recommend somebody watch because they're so compelling and he's such a great presenter. One of them was called um, his- uh, Michael, uh, Michael, his, Mike, yeah? Michael I, I'm sorry, I just want to stop you because you, um, you were just describing Sidney Smith and you also froze. So if you wouldn't mind just starting again with whatever you want to say about Sidney, then sure. you're yep. whole thing. Yeah, just last night I watched a second video of this guy, Sid Smith, Sidney, B. Sidney Smith. He's a, a former math teacher in Virginia. And uh, he has a 2018 presentation that he, does, uh, that he did, was recorded up on YouTube. Uh, I think it's at uh, uh, Virginia Tech or maybe University of Virginia, I forget. And, uh, and then 2019. And one of them, uh, the 2018 one was, was called Humanity's Final Chapter. And then the 2019 was How to Enjoy the End of the World by Sid Smith. And both of them are fabulous. I mean, just unbelievably excellent presentations. So right along the lines of what you're saying, I mean, he, he, he educated me around propaganda. I mean, I understood, you know, a lot of that. But anyway, I just wanted to recommend that to anybody watching or listening to this conversation. Thank you. I'll check it out. Yeah. So um, as you know, uh, Dean, I really... The thing that's the heart of this particular podcast series is uh, various thought leaders, teachers, uh, coaches, authors uh, related to collapse and uh, climate and overshoot and all that kind of stuff, sharing their stories, sharing their journeys, sharing like, how did you go from when you grew up, you touched, you began touching a little bit on this, but how did you go? Like, what was your worldview like growing up? And then how did that shift? Was it sudden? Was it dramatic? What were any books or uh, uh, people that were particularly instrumental at various times? So share a little bit about, not just a little bit, take as long as you want about your story of how you came to where you are now in terms of your worldview, and especially in how you've come to what I'm calling a post-doom place, a place beyond just freak out and, and, uh, and grief, but action and um, and helping others to have the best lives possible and, and uh, to uh, engage themselves in whatever healing work they need to do to be a blessing to their communities and whatever scale they can make a difference. So you're, you're one, of the, uh, one of the leaders in doing that. And uh, so anyway, so share your journey, uh, anything you wanna share. Okay, thanks. Uh, I, I feel really blessed that I was introduced to the ocean. Uh, again, I, I've mentioned a couple of times, I had a pretty rough growing up with alcoholic mother and lots of difficulties and so on. And uh, to be connected with the ocean uh, in my preteen years was a, literally a lifesaver and it continued to be so punctuated throughout my life. And uh, not too long after I was introduced to the ocean, I was introduced to Jacques Cousteau, who was an adult and he was artful and he was um, adventurous and an inventor. Uh, and he would do his specials on TV and he would, these would be magical journeys into something I've never seen this level of beauty in nature before. It was, I, it's hard to overstate. He would also, in each of these specials on TV, 
he would also take us to a place where human destruction was obvious to him and his team. And because he had invented this ability to take extraordinary video footage or film footage underneath the water, we could see it and he would describe, you know, and this, if it continues, this entire area will die. And I would find myself in tears yes. and no one else in the room was in tears, you know, bless my parents' hearts. You know, they, they did what they did. And mm -hmm. I, it's not like these are bad people or other people were bad. It's just, I found myself sensitive to the, the truth of what he was saying. And then there was an, a deep impression on me as I took that little nugget of here is a man I can trust. Here is someone who's vividly painting a picture of the destruction of life on this planet. I knew at, at, I don't know, what was it, 11 years old or something, that the impossibility of infinite growth on a finite planet, I knew it. Mm -hmm. And I knew that the adults around me were ignoring it. Mm -hmm. And I could count on them to continue to do that destruction because none of them responded to Jacques Cousteau the way I was. Right. So that was a, a massive impression and foundation for me. Um, when hang, I, on, hang on, hang on, one second, uh, Dean. Uh, I, I wanted to stop you just at the end of that uh, sentence because I've got a cat that is whining at the door, and the cat litter box is over here. So <laughs> I have to attend to. Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. There. We go. <laughs> I realized. Oh, I shut the door. That's where the cat food in the cat litter box is. I probably should open the door. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so continue. Um, well, I, when I add that, that experience of the kind of call it the Jacques Cousteau, and by the way, there was another piece that was cornerstone quality as well, which was Rachel Carson, which my mother taught me about her work very early on. Um, I dedicated the impossible conversation that, 2017 book uh, to both of them, Jacques Cousteau and, and Rachel Carson. And when I combined my love of earth through them, th with the uh, connection with earth, my, my getting myself out into the deserts and the ocean and elsewhere, with the kind of uh, shamanic and energetic anchored experiences um, from then all the way till now, uh, I, I knew in my heart of hearts that we were not only completely unsustainable, but we were accelerating. You know, this is right in the late 70s. I could see it crystal clear. And I also think I mentioned before that I put my insight about all that in my back pocket and in my front pocket was let's go have a wonderful career and do what I'm supposed to do says all the stories of my culture yeah. and I had the most wonderful run of doing transformational training work and oftentimes being able to do that out of doors with people producing miraculous work in personal people's personal lives I, in my own life and have my own deep practices going along with it and flying around from sexy conference center to sexy conference center and being paid decently to do that. And um, every year I would have a number of punctuated moments of remembering how far off track I was letting myself get. And so I'm not perfect here and I haven't uh, fully forgiven myself for <clears throat> having all that knowledge and still being complicit and diving in deeper mm -hmm. for a number of years in a row. Mm -hmm. um, but I can say that I have had a, a magnificent run. I'm deeply grateful and I do have regrets. I do have things that I'm still doing some, in some, deep process work to to find a way to let go and forgive and so on um, which really took took me to southern Oregon where I live now and have lived for more than 20 years and um, what I can say is that I have I have been doing that that work to bring myself back to center and to core 
and to a sense of being empowered and alive, as fully alive as I can muster, uh, even with my history, even with my day by day complicity in what we're all grappling with. And that has gone to an entirely new level in um, this work with the, you know, facing the collapse of earth and human systems. Uh, and what I can say, if there was one word that I can say that wove through all the different kinds of personal practices that I did, all the work that I did and do now, is a, uh, the experience of grace. Mm. And uh, without this experience of grace, I am crystal clear, I would have been dead a long time ago. And I would not have had nearly as much connection with life as I now have. Um, where that came from briefly was, again, from the practices and the deep experiences that I've been blessed to have in my life. And then uh, a number of uh, extended immersions in that state of grace. And ironically, I'm not a religious person at all. And I've, I've been actually uh, very aggressively anti-fundamentalist religions of any kind, given what, what I was able to research and see what, what's been the impact of fundamentalist religions. And it's, it's not been good. But ironically, many of my Positions that I've had, particularly. Wait, 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 wait. You years. said ironically, ironically, many of my, and then you froze. So take it with, start it with ironically. Ironically, many of my impossible conversations that I've had with people over these past few years in particular have been with people who are fundamentalists, you know, in, mostly Christians in the USA, but others as well. And, um, I, I oftentimes find a way that we can speak and go deep with each other and sharing generously with each other when we talk about whatever their version of grace is. Because many of the re religious traditions, as you know way better than I do, have some, some sense of expansion and unity consciousness at their core. And that's what I would call grace. And I, because particularly uh, the longer immersions in grace that I've been lucky enough to have in my life, I've, I've now got a, an ability to call up that state basically at will. And that's a part of what I offer in my work when I was describing, you know, mm -hmm. just give my gifts to the world best I, I know how. I can't imagine a more gorgeous gift to be giving uh, to those who are ready you know, and wanting that, that kind of experience to add to their life. Yeah. Well, you know, it, 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 I want to just interject because um, in addition to people, you know, working with you on that, uh, you're using language that's pretty abstract transformation groups that, you know, do transformation grace. Can you name any of the names of organizations or movements or individuals that have been particularly uh, positive for you, that are impactful, that have made a difference, including what you've done work-wise? Yeah. Well, I, I mentioned before there were uh, a couple of the transformational training groups that I ended up working with that were particularly profound. Um, somewhat because of the content that they put together and the, the quality of the experiences that they offered to those who participated and those of us who worked it. Uh, one of those is, is uh, used to be called the EST training. It's now called the forum. And uh, I don't, I don't know much about it now in terms of it being the forum. I, I, um, fell away from all of that kind of work a few, quite a few years ago because it, it ran flat. So it gave me great uh, tools and, and deep experiences and deep bonding that was not melodramatic. It was not the usual kind of in, encumbered relatedness. It, there was a lot of freedom and power and, and connection in those early relationships that I was able, lucky to to form with my fellow workers and so on. 
Um, yeah, let me uh, let me jump in there real quick because uh, I also benefited greatly from uh, the Landmark Forum and Landmark Education in general. In the late 1990s, I found that it, it put together so many different things because I've also been involved for most of my adult life in various forms of empowerment work, trainings, uh, transformational education, what have you. Um, the ones that I found perhaps most impactful, I'd, I ended up becoming a neurolinguistic programming uh, trainer and uh, uh, Milton Erickson, Ericksonian hypnotherapy I did for a while. And then uh, the men's work that I did with the, the, new, the new warrior training uh, and the mankind project started by Bill Kouth who, uh, uh, and others, but I interviewed him as part of this series as well. But that was really powerful and landmark education. I mean, I went on to become a landmark introduction to the forum leader, and I, you know, might have gone the path of pursuing that as a career had I not been so passionate about this epic of evolution, you know, sort of deep sustainability work with Connie. Yeah. Uh, and my son became an introduction to the forum leader. So um, I, 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 I agree with you. There's a, it's not, it's not complete. Um, and there are some significant missing pieces, and yet, nonetheless, uh, I have found, and my, several of my family members have found, and I think I've enrolled about 50 people in the forum over the years, right. uh, but found it very powerful stuff in terms of like the, the, how our brains work and how we co-create our experience of reality by what we tell, tell ourselves, and how to take full responsibility for your life, not playing the blame game. Yeah. Um, and how to, how to identify integrity as honoring your word, that sort of thing. So, yeah. Well, I, yeah, thank you. I, that's a very similar uh, kind of patchwork of value that I have experienced in those as well, the, the Mankind Project as well. Bill Kauf lives just down the road from me, and we, we meet in a monthly uh, MKP meeting here in Southern Oregon as well. You know, you're, you're inspiring me to mention a couple of different modalities, methodologies that uh, are a part of a toolkit that I've been putting together for myself and also for the, the, any of the people that uh, want to participate in the work that I am creating. Well, this is great um, because this is, a, this is a perfect time because my next question was going to be what tools, practices, exercises, you know, what have, what's helped you along the path? So. Yeah. Um, you know, the short answer to that question is <clears throat> in my body of work and in my own personal expression of my practices, um, it's all about reconnection. Because I, I think I mentioned a few minutes ago at the core of why I wrote the book and the, my whole woke moment and so on is what happened to get us to this predicament that we're in. And the answer kept coming back that we disconnected. We've disconnected from deeper self, from others, from earth, and from soul. And so the simple, simple way to look at my work, in case you ever need a short elevator, shorter than an elevator pitch, is my work is, is truly about reconnecting with the web of life in each of those dimensions. So uh, to borrow hugely from Joanna Macy, this is the work that reconnects. And it's at a very different and deeper level than what anything I've experienced from the beautiful people. And, and Molly Young Brown is a very dear friend. And I just have a very different and, and I think far deeper take on what it means to reconnect. Uh, for me, it involves uh, a deep level of uh, exploration and articulation of that which we've disconnected from. So if I've disconnected from my deeper self, that means I've got a gaping hole of unawareness in myself at my center. And then I'm wondering, why am I feeling so in despair? Why do I feel so helpless in the face of all these problems on the planet? And on and on it goes. And why do I not feel connected? Why do we not talk with each other about what matters most when I speak, when I'm thinking about how disconnected I am with other people. Yeah. And again, the list just is dauntingly long of the costs of our disconnection. Yeah. And so this work and my own practices are absolutely anchored to either they have some value of reconnecting me and us to the web of life, or they don't get on the list. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> great. That's great. Wow. Well, this leads me into my next question related to uh, human nature. Basically, you know, do you see or how do you see human nature either facilitating or hindering um, us in this, um, you know, now process of uh, societal cultural deterioration? You know, it, it is your sense of human nature, just anything you want to say about the whole human nature question? Yeah. I'll actually just combine the the last few sentences from the prior question and and then to this one. I there are a couple of of methodologies that I think are very very useful. One that there are, must be ten different kinds of circling methodologies. Basic circle coming together with other people in an intentional way, in hopefully a, a safe and a compassionate way to be able to uh, invite a richer inner experience and a sense of connecting with others. There's lots of that. And at the most basic level, people need that because by the default average person has no clue how to come together with other people in a compassionate, strong, safe way. Mm -hmm. There are, that there are next level powerful tools and experiences and methodologies beyond that. And those I think are the, the ones that address the next level of your, your most recent question of how do we address human nature? Human nature as it shows up in the 20th century, what's gotten us here is separation separation and disconnection everywhere we look. Mm -hmm. So there's not much right now signaling that we're going to come together in some kumbaya way on a large scale. It just, it's, I'm not seeing it. If you are, you better let me know. No. The more powerful methodologies beyond the coming together in a simple way in circles. I mean, God bless, that's a great place to start. And, mm -hmm. and people just need to Google circling and, and it'll be, you can find it on the web and start to do it. Right. But the, in terms of real, you know, depth of human nature, I don't know of a single methodology. I'm, I'm working peripherally with Jem Bendel and, and um, forming part of his deep adaptation forum, how do people come together in some significant way to develop what he likes to call deep adaptation. And I think the only real tools that are gonna make any kind of substantive difference are gonna be ones that, that have us do deep digging in ourselves, really looking at the shadow in ourselves. How does the individual shadow show up in my life so that I can, can put my awareness on that and my intent on that to bring it to some kind of healing, uh, not to mention how boldly obvious it is that we live in a shadow-driven world. And I don't know of any methodologies that are directly um, marrying, if you will, the exploration of what Jem calls the deep adaptation work and a, and a really sober look at what's going on in this world. Mm. And so there's, there are a couple of methodologies that I've put together in that, that tool, inner toolbox that I keep talking about that really do that deeper work. For those, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. Yeah. This, is, this is like, you wanna, so you wanna do a marathon or you wanna do an ultra marathon? Uh, this is how to practice. This is how to train for it. And um, so I'm very pleased to say that I'm engaged with a, a number of methodologies with that. And that it's not that everybody's forced to do that. I'm saying mm -hmm. there are certain people that know they're willing to step into the hard, hard work that, that's implied here. I think there's a, there's a kind of a just getting by and surviving level that I think the vast majority of us at best are gonna get there. They're gonna, they're gonna go into the circles, they're gonna have a compassionate softness, 
they're going to forgive themselves. They're going to, you know, it's going to be recycling and changing light bulbs and, and kind of wringing our hands about how things are so tough, but that's going to be about as good as it gets for many, many people. Mm -hmm. And there are certain people that will just know, all right, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to go to the next level of being alive and fully as fully present as I possibly can be, no matter what the circumstances are. That takes serious training and serious courage. That's where courage needs to show up. Yeah. And that's um, one aspect. That's kind of like the, the steep gradient side of, of the work yeah. that I'm doing. Yeah. Well, if somebody's watching or listening to this and they find themselves saying, Hey, I'm in that second group. I want to know more about this. Where would they go? How do they reach out to you? How do they find what you're talking about? Yeah. So I, I have uh, the website, which is livingresilience.net and um, a podcast, which is a YouTube channel called the poetry of predicament. And um, there's a second uh, kind of a sub set of that poetry of predicament YouTube channel, which is, uh, we're calling it take my hand conscious parenting in the face of collapse and predicament. And um, like the summit that you're putting together here, um, this is a series of conversations. Uh, in fact, you're going to be one of those folks. It's exactly. going to be good. Looking forward to it. Um, so these are the kind of offerings that we're putting together. It's also going to, it is the home of a number of online learning series so you know brief set of three or four 20 minute videos with some support material to particularly highlight a distinction or an aspect of this high gradient work and it starts at the easiest level at the level of just what happened what are some things we can do on the on a day-to-day -day living basis to just come together a little bit better, to be a little bit more civil and, and more connected and more aware in our world. And then as, as a, if a person decides, you know, I do, do want to make those big step that was talking about. So start, start it again. If a person, you, you froze, you froze just before, just after you said, as a person decides. So start that again. Yeah. If a person decides. Yeah. If a, if a person decides to, do like you were just saying, Michael, to, to, yeah, I'm, I'm one of those people. I'm really ready to, to do this hard stuff and take on the, the, um, potentially more life producing, more life inducing elements that are really de extraordinarily demanding then I can take these steps in the learning series that, that, we're offering or the coaching that's offered or you know workshops that are offered it, there are going to be all kinds of um, opportunities for people to come together or to study on their own and to take on the level of work that feels right to them yeah yeah that's great that's great thank you for sharing that yeah. well a few more questions i want to uh invite you to uh uh, expound on or share your perspective on one is related to uh, the big picture, the universe story, the epic of evolution, um, big history or big green history, however it's called, but basically the, the, the science based history of everyone and everything told in a meaningful way. How has that, if that has informed or assisted you in your work at all or in your own psyche? Hmm. You know, there's another lineage, another methodology that I'd like to bring up here because uh, it's very current for me. I've been speaking with a lot of, of the people who are in this body of work. It's um, the work of a woman named Louise Lebrun and an, uh, one of the most vocal spokespeople of that work is uh, a, an extraordinary author and just an inspiring human being named Deb Ozarko. 
and uh, they they are offer some of the most clear and piercing articulation of of how they deploy their attention, how they look into this world to then participate in this world. And it's, uh, if, if somebody hasn't heard of either of these two, um, I would recommend highly uh, checking them out. Yeah, I had a wonderful conversation with Deb Ozarko uh, just yeah. a few weeks ago. And uh, so she'll also be part of this post-Doom series. Yeah, I agree to it. She's awesome. Beautiful. And, you know, bottom line of what I'm trying to relay from her and them is there is, um, I'm finding less and less usefulness in diving deep into the rivets and bolts and, and fabric of the history that we've told ourselves, the stories we've told ourselves. I, I um, think there's kind of a romantic version of, well, what we are is storytelling beings and we've, you know, our old story is no longer serving us. So now we need a new story and it's gonna be a really great story. And all religions have been great stories and blah, blah, blah stories. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to be derogatory. I've just found less and less value in that track. There's this, this phrase in, in business technology, or business terminology called, um, there's no cheese down that tunnel. So the mouse that in the experiment goes down and learns the right tunnel to go down to get the cheese. There's no cheese for me down that tunnel of exploring our ways of telling ourselves stories that have ended up with us here. Because all I can find is the death and destruction that got us here. It's extraordinarily difficult for me to to winnow out some goodness that I want to weave into some new fabric. What I'm far more interested in is a vibrant and piercing level of, of awareness in the moment, of presence in the moment. And to borrow again from Deb Ozarko, you know, I love how she defines hope is activated presence. That's a definition of presence that I can get behind. That's it's the a definition kind of, of hope you mean. Yeah, it, that's the um, the quality of aliveness that carries me forward. Like I wish there was a story that I could either look back and so appreciate how cool it is and how inspiring it's been and how much morale it's it's created i i don't have much there so i yeah, hope it, i'm not disappointing you in my answer no 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 you, you, you just you just fr you you froze uh if you could say the last two sentences again that would be awesome because otherwise i'll have to cut it okay you say i wish there was a story hmm. i wish there was some sort of story or set of stories that i could look back on and say that is so honorable and so respectable and that's the miracle that humanity has been and that's been our remarkable miraculous story that'll then transform itself into some new even more grand iteration into our future i don't see it i don't i don't think we've earned that place in whatever that magical library is in the universe um i think ours is uh a rather tragic story and it doesn't involve at this point being very present even as the calling is for optimal presence right now if we could yeah so there you go <laughs> yeah well no I, I mean what i mean by you know as you know the connie's in my main website is the org, and what i mean by the great story is simply a way of uh, telling the history of physical evolution, biological evolution, and cultural evolution that makes sense of our times, helps us understand how we got in this mess, and can console and inspire us in a post-doom way, uh, regardless of whether we survive or not. And the big difference between the way I tell that story now 
uh, from how I told that story prior to seven years ago is enormous. My, my, I mean, I, I don't even recommend my own book, Thank God for Evolution, anymore because I still was very much caught in a human-centered, anthropocentric, techno-optimist understanding of things. And I now reject all of that. And so now I, I still use the phrase, the great story, but what I'm meaning by that is something very, very different. So I, I appreciate your critique of sort of the... Uh, fetish of narrative and story, and yet I still am inspired to articulate a worldview, uh, a, a, way of our, a, a way of narrating the history of everyone and everything that, that performs the role uh, of traditional cosmologies, of a cr traditional creation story, which is, it's not whether this is true in a capital T sense or not, but does this integrate our best evidential and inspirational understandings such that it really does make sense of our times mm -hmm. and then can actually inspire us to that sort of that activated presence of which you were just speaking and what Debo Bizarco speaks about. So. Nice. Yeah. Anything on, on permanence and death? Like how has uh, uh, an understanding of, I mean, I don't want to load this question. So for me, just to put my cards on the table, I find the fact of impermanence and death to be profoundly inspiring. The fact that I'm going to die, the fact that we are, as a species are gonna go extinct, whether that's in five years or five million years, it's probably gonna be in that window. Um, and uh, I, find that, uh, I find that when I, when I step back, as you know, I think I've done programs for 10 years on a sacred science approach to mortality and death. And that death is the most, or one of the most essential things in the his, in in life. You can't have a universe without death, at all scales. So, I find death and impermanence uh, and mortality profoundly inspiring. But not everybody's there, and certainly most of us grew up in homes and families and schools where we didn't get that perspective at all. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, anything you want to say about impermanence and death? Yeah. Well, I have the the pleasure, the privilege of, of doing uh, grief uh, leading or facilitating uh, grief groups here in the Rogue Valley in Southern Oregon with a, a wonderful little um, organization, public service organization that calls itself Winter Spring, offering this kind of grief support and so on. And I've done an awful lot of uh, being with people who are approaching death and uh, and those grieving around them, and it is a privilege. and And far more often than not, there's there's plenty of that stuff that I mentioned before that I and others call grace in those moments. And it, it, it's not everybody. There are some people that hold on tight all the way to their last breath, but they're they're way more often than not have um, big doses of grace as a person is approaching death and I feel honored to be uh, ha having had that experience uh, of being with them in that uh, I can say that I've been close to death a number of times myself and I don't fear death nearly as much as I fear the ignorance and the polarity and cruelty and so on that's showing up in these times that can cause suffering. The amount of suffering that I predict, even in the very few, live, few years that I have left as being an old guy on the planet, um, I, I just wouldn't wish that on us. You know, I don't really fear it like I don't lose sleep over it because I'm, <clears throat> I think to be truthful, I, that's what I most touch in with grace for mm. is to remember who I am, which is present here now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the death and the fixation on it and the avoidance of it and so on that is so culturally uh, abundant, I, um, I have understood I understand and I'm, I have compassion for our culture, which most people don't have much facility with being present in the face 
of our mortality. Uh, I find it's delicious when I can be in the presence of someone else who we can share the presence of that deliciousness of being very, very present in the face of our own mortality. Yeah. Um, and I have huge compassion for the average person in the world who doesn't have that. Yeah. All they know is it's something to be backpedaled from and avoided as at all costs. And, um, and I, I wish us all well, because yeah. we're going to have plenty of opportunities to be near to the suffering and death that will be plentiful again, in my prediction of the coming years. Yeah, 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 that's great. Well, Dean, I'm curious, um, what's opened up for you on the other side of the sort of stages of grief, on the other side of the doom door, but on the post-doom side, what's opened up, what are they, as Paul Traferka calls it, finding the gifts? Um, yeah, share anything you want about that. Well, first, I want to thank you for mentioning the name Paul Chaferka. I have never met the man and I know that you have been a huge ally for him for quite some time and I want to thank you for that. Uh, I found his his writing to be immensely inspiring for me and very useful for me. So I just thank you for mentioning his name and I want to honor him. He's a big part of this, uh, this work, this body of work. Uh, at every person who does the intro level of my work will be very familiar with Paul Traferka. So um, would you mind repeating your question? Because Yes, I, uh, I sure. Uh, uh, there. Paul Traferka, one of his posts, yeah, I, I, I too found his Approaching the Limits a website and he wrote extensively from 2008 to 2000, November 2013 and he kind of just stopped writing then and uh, I just love his writings um, and uh, and so the question is, what has opened up for you on the other side uh, beyond mere acceptance? You know, the Kubler-Ross stages of grief, there's acceptance, but there can also be that place of finding the gift and being a blessing. So how, what's opened up for you on that other side? Yeah, I think the shorthand version of an answer to that would be that this thing I keep calling grace, this state of being that I keep calling grace, and I, I'm not trying to say that I coined that phrase by any stretch, but that's what I've been kind of advised to call it, um, is the ultimate in letting go. There's a deep, deep level of letting go, and I, I had a meditation practice for uh, I don't know, 45 years, um, and I kept thinking I knew what it meant to let go. That how, what does letting go mean in this process and meditation and other parts of growing? And uh, every time there would be a deeper letting go. And so the combination of, of act, being able to access this grace, this sense of unity, this sense of, sense of ultimate expansion and in interbeing with other life uh, is there, you know, post doom and post uh, all the, <laughs> all the preparations and all the hubbub. Yeah. Um, so letting go, there's, there's still a part of grieving for me um, that is about honoring life. Yes. And where my heart goes to grieve is just to remember in as deep an honoring way as I can the impact of various living beings have made on me, um, like what I was sharing about Jacques Cousteau. And when I think about the whales that I've seen and loved uh, in my life and the uh, other um, marine mammals that I'm very, very fond of and, and other animals I could literally go, keep going on and on in the list of those that I honor and that breaks my heart that there is a deep grief in honoring their demise and through our efforts, good and bad, 
we have um, removed them from the planet and that um, that is there it's it's a bittersweet honoring yeah, yeah. that I now call grief different than other expressions of grief that I've had for myself in the past. I'm not sure. Am I answering your question? Yeah, no, this is great. This, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the letting go is hard to express in, in a short and um, concise way, but it's extraordinarily important here. And this, this state of grace is hard to overstate, but again, difficult to convey. So I hope I'm conveying just a small fraction of it to folks so they can kind of hear it and resonate or not with, with what I'm describing. Um, I think that's all I have for the moment. Sure. Well, I, I too find the, the word grace really works for me. I mean, I, I experience and interpret grace as um, unmerited blessing, unmerited you know, uh, a favor that I didn't earn it, uh, that it, and we didn't earn it, that it just was given by life, by God, by the universe, by reality. And you, you know that I use those terms pretty interchangeably. Yes, you do. And, and so I, I find that Connie and I regularly remind ourselves, uh, that we're richer than Kings, uh, that we are graced to be alive at such perilous, challenging a uh, terrifying uh, time, and yet um, it it all still feels like grace that we you know we didn't choose to be alive in uh, a time of uh, industrial rape of the planet. Uh, this is these are systems, economic, political, governmental, uh, religious systems that have been at work for thousands of years that we're inheritors of, and yet we now have several centuries of scientific understanding so we have a and communication that allows us to understand you know to learn what's happening all over the per planet and for if we try to keep our hearts open it can we can stay in grief and and uh, a lot and yet that grief as joanna macy says so aptly and so accurately is a measure of our love we wouldn't be feeling that grief if, if it weren't for our profound interconnectedness and interrelatedness and our love yeah. and so i coming back to that you know, metaphor of the post-doom doorway that's in the middle of denial and regeneration with or without us, people avoid that door because they're afraid that doom is the end point. They don't know it's the midpoint. Yeah. They think it's the end and they're gonna spend the rest of their lives in despair. And, and yet when they go through that door and allow themselves to begin experiencing these outward spheres of gratitude and presence, activated presence, I like that, <coughs> they turn back and look at that door that they've now gone through and it still says W A S F at the top, but they experience it, interpret it very differently than it, they did on the fear side approaching that, that what kept them from going through that door. Cause they knew it meant we are so fucked, but then they turn back and they says, we are so fortunate and they allow themselves to feel that, that we are conscious of the fact that we're in collapse. We're conscious of the fact that collapse is existing at all scales, not just human, but biospheric and, and species. And yet, and, and we're conscious of the fact that we can actually grieve that and hold that in our hearts without it, have, without it hardening us to become bitter and cynical and whatever. We can stay in that place of grace, that place of humility, that place of generosity, that place of compassion. And so I, you know, for me, it's a huge deal finding the gift on the other side of mere acceptance. Acceptance is great. Um, but, um, well, Dean, last question, uh, and then anything you'd like to share to bring this to closure. Um, but what's your, what's your take on what's beyond our control, but what still may be in our control? Like, where do you see, uh, what's your sense of what's no longer possible but what still is possible. I think it's important for, for me to say that I, I encourage people to find what, what matters most to them from as disengaged a place as possible, disengaged from the business as usual human operating system, but to really look newly, you know, maybe 
maybe look at if you had a year to live, what would you do differently and what matters most to you? That kind of a frame. Yes, exactly. And so if people want to uh, engage with Extinction Rebellion and Greta Thunberg, or if they want to learn the cello or go to Vegas and rack up their cards, I really don't care. Whatever people want to do, I would, I most want people to find what matters most to them as they reconnect with the web of life. I, I, I just got to interject. The last one, go to Vegas and rack up your card. I'm not a wholehearted support. I'm not a support of that at all, even if it turns somebody on because it's too fucking self-centered. It's too wasteful. So I, I'm with you on all the others, but I, I, I maybe it's my own uh, unevolved nature, but I can't go with celebrating if that's, uh, if that's what matters most to somebody. I, yeah. and it's, that's just I my just, limitations. I just know that it's way above my pay grade to figure out what's the right thing or the wrong thing. And I'm happy to condemn it. So there we go. <laughs> there <you> go. There <laughs> I've been in the world of addiction and recovery for 30 years. And yeah. uh, I, uh, I just find it hard to okay. Okay. genuinely support that as someone's choice. But anyway, continue. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. So um, what we have, the ability to change more than any single thing is how we deploy our attention and presence in this world. And so uh, what I would strongly recommend is that people find the most potent methodologies possible to optimize and maximize their ability to be present in the face of larger and larger stressors. Um, it, 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 again, that's the work that I was describing earlier as the preparing for an ultra marathon. It takes work to expand these capacities to be present, especially when things get tough and things promise to get tough. So that's what I would suggest. People who are sincerely love, want to love their children, I would say stop lying to them that the world is just fine and it's just the same way it was 30 years ago or whatever, it's not. And I would, I would strongly suggest for them to find the piercingly difficult path of living their truth from a position of ultimate sobriety that I think you and I have been talking about this whole time. And so um, back from there, whatever your capacity allows as a portion of that, a portion of that truth, encouraging a portion of that truth in your own children, your own neighbors, your own family members, your own workmates, you may discover as you look at your own work, is this the fulfilling work that I want to be living in this, the most important time in human history, then continue doing that work. If not, then it might be time to radically change virtually everything in your life. These, these are these are obviously choices that can only be made by each individual, but you ask the question. So this is what I would suggest. And certainly this is what I'm doing. And I can't imagine anything more important to be doing than continuing to expand our capacity to be present as alive human beings in this moment, to be able to be present in the face of, more and more challenging and stressful situations uh, and, and be creative and have some fun. Amen. Yeah, that's a perfect. You know, that's the work, the work that I have been trying to do. I've, I've been trying to describe this, this different kinds of work, the, the different levels and gradients of the work in our talk today. And the thing that I haven't mentioned is just how deeply deeply love-filled and joyous and, and rewarding, I mean, soul rewarding it is to engage in that level of practice yes. of being alive and uh, of building out those capacities and skills. Um, and it's the hardest thing I've ever done <laughs> by far. Hardest thing I've ever done and most fulfilling thing I could ever imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Well, that sounds like a perfect note to conclude on. Anything you'd like to say to be complete? 
Yeah, I, uh, I've mentioned this in other recordings that you and I have done, but it seems particularly important to say it now. I, uh, one of the first most important things that I saw that I got to read or got to watch and experience as I had my woke moment of abrupt climate change and these massive uh, human impacts on our, our planet and coming to terms with it was your earlier summit that you did uh, six years ago or so. And it was this, it still is. I mean, people go to your site and dig into those videos. There's the most extraordinary list of people and speakers. And um, I realized this is some, this is what's possible for somebody who gives a shit. Mm. Somebody who really cares and really has a heart and an integrity and a spine can, can, can just commit themselves to bringing together these important voices mm -hmm. and putting them out for people. And in addition to all the other audios and videos and mm -hmm. books that you've read into, into recordings and on and on that you and Connie do, I just want to be sure that people know that about you. And the, the, if you haven't listened to uh, Michael's work on a different 10 commandments, I mean, for me, who is a committed atheist, oh my God, this guy has got an extraordinary gift for bringing my attention to something that resonates with the core of my experience of life, not about religion, about life. Yes. So thank you, Michael, for the work that you've done that way and that you now continue to do with this series and I'm sure whatever is next. So. Thank you for including me in this and thank you for the work that you do. Wow. Well, gosh, thank you for that affirmation, brother, and that acknowledgement. I, I deeply honor you for that. Yeah, that series that the future is calling us to greatness, 2014, I did the interviews and then it went live in January 2015. Uh, but uh, 56 of the world's top experts on climate and deep sustainability and a sprinkling of spiritual leaders that help us hold this scary stuff without just freaking out. Um, and yeah, anybody who's uh, listening to this conversation or watching this conversation, um, you can access both on SoundCloud, The Future is Calling Us to Greatness. I've got all the audio files there. And then on Tree of Life website, uh, I've got all the videos there that are up on, on YouTube actually as well. So, And, and uh, the, the video that he's referring to, there's a 17 minute video on YouTube called Reality's Rules. 10 commandments to avoid extinction. And uh, so you can find that little 20 minute. Uh, I, I actually spent three years working with that. I sending ideas out to other colleagues, getting their feedback because loyal Rue has, who's a philosopher of religion and a dear friend and colleague um, and older brother on the, on the sort of lit, religious naturalism path. Uh, we, we were talking, you know, quite a few years ago about the possibility of articulating like what is reality telling us today? You know, if, if, if God is nothing less than a personification of reality, like what's reality telling us? And uh, evidentially. And so I came up with the first draft, shared it with a few colleagues, then th that got edited and over the course of about two years ended up uh, creating that, uh, that video, Reality's Rules. So thank you for that. That's great. Cool. All right, Dean. Blessings. Michael, thank you so much. Thank you, brother. Thanks for watching another episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast produced by Dean Walker and the Living Resilience Alliance, www.livingresilience.net. Music today from Michael Hedges, as always, and also Port Blue into the Sea. Also available on our website, www.livingresilience.net, is a wide array of articles, online learning series, arranging group and individual resilience coaching, and sign up for our every other Tuesday free support group that we call Safe Circle Calls.